Hi everyone, this is the antimicrobial medications lecture. So in this lecture, you're going to learn about basically antibiotics and there will be just a couple slides on antiviral medications and antifungal medications. So we're going to learn about some antibiotics that you've heard of, you've used or family members have used, different ways we test if antibiotics, antibiotics are effective in lab and how, anti, uh, how bacteria have developed resistance to antibiotics. Antibiotics. So in our lecture, we're going to talk about features of antibiotics, the mechanism of action of like tetracycline, penicillin, different antibiotics. Again, tests we do in lab, the development of antibiotics and why it's lagged, resistance, antiviral drugs, and antifungal drugs. So hopefully it'll be a very important lecture, for, important lecture for you guys in your life and whatever career you end up choosing. So to start off with the history and development of antibiotics, antibiotics were basically discovered in 1928. I wouldn't say they were made in 1928, but that was the year that Alexander Fleming, who was a scientist, discovered that a mold was inhibiting a bacterium called Staphylococcus from growing. That mold was penicillium, and we call the drug that we made from that mold penicillin. So he saw that wherever the mold penicillin grew on his agar plate that had bacteria on it, specifically had Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus was inhibited, so he didn't see growth where the mold is. So um, if you ever have mold on bread or fruit and you eat it, I always joke around with my family and say, are you're just getting more antibiotics, but you should still be careful. And then another scientist came and discovered a new antibiotic called streptomycin from soil bacteria. So the reason I'm telling you guys this is that this is how we discover new antibiotics. Researchers go to soil, to different areas of the ocean around the world, and they screen for antibiotics being made. And antibiotics are made by different organisms such as bacteria, such as fungus, and I'm going to start off with some definitions and then we'll get into the drugs. Antimicrobial is any drug that inhibits the growth or kills microorganisms. So and what we think of as antibiotics can really, called, be, can really be called antibacterial drugs. Antifungal drugs target fungus. Antiprotozoal drugs target protozoa like um, Plasmodium falciparum, which causes malaria. And antibiotics are made by organisms, certain fungus, certain, certain bacteria against competing microorganisms. So a lot of times students ask me in class, well, why would bacteria make antibiotics? And I always tell you guys this, and I said it in lab, there, if a bacteria does make and secrete an antibiotic, it's not making it to kill itself, it's making it to kill other bacteria around. And same thing with fungus. They're trying, if they do make it, like the penicillin, they're trying to kill other organisms because if you kill other organisms you benefit as a microbe because you have more area to grow in and you have more nutrients and then finally antiviral drugs are drugs that interfere with viral replication and we'll talk about antivirals towards the end but the lecture is really going to focus on bacteria and antibiotics so there are many sources of antibiotics. Um, th this is just a table in case some of you do not have the book, but we have gained many of our antibiotics from different gram-positive bacteria. So if anyone's heard of like streptomycin, chloramphenicol, polymyxin, Bastrocin, so all these different antibiotics, we got them from gram-positive rods. And then different fungus species have given us antibiotics such as penicillin. And scientists are always on the search of new antibiotics because we will talk about it later. A lot of these antibiotics are not very effective anymore because bacteria are developing resistance to them. And this is how you discover antibiotics. You screen different parts of the world for compounds that are secreted or made by organisms to kill other organisms. In the characteristics of antimicrobial drugs, whenever you're creating an antimicrobial drug, like if you're a research company, you need to take into consideration many different things. We're going to talk about each one. We need to consider how toxic the microbe is to the host, which let's say it's you, the human. We want to make sure it's toxic to the microbe, but not the host. You want to think about the action, the drug's action. 
its spectrum of activity? Is it um, hurting a few bacterial species or many bacterial species? How is it distributed in the body? How is it metabolized? Is it excreted through sweat, through urine? Route of administration, is your drug that you're creating IV to be effective or in the muscle IM orally, topically, such as Neosporin is a topical antibiotic? Effective drug combinations, um, does your drug affect uh, something else that someone is taking, like a heart medication? And adverse effects, are you, is your drug going to cause allergies? So we're gonna talk about each of these characteristics, but I want everyone to keep these in mind. Any, every drug that's been created in the world, so we're focusing on antibiotics, but you can also think of this with like cancer drugs or drugs for anything. And even actually, if we use coronavirus drugs as an example, you wanna consider all of these things how like if you create a coronavirus drug you want to make sure that it's toxic to the virus and not the human its action how is it affecting the human how is it affecting the virus its spectrum of activity is it targeting just that virus or is it targeting a lot of different viruses in the body tissue distribution and um, is your drug going to the lungs for example the kidneys because we know with coronavirus it's causing lung infections how is it metabolized is is it, is it going to the stomach and then being broken down all of a sudden so it's not effective? Right of administration, are you going to create an oral drug or does it have to be injected in someone? Is your drug going to affect someone's cholesterol medications? Adverse effects, or is it potentially toxic, allergic? So we're going to go over each one, but we're focusing on antibiotics and resistance because it's antibiotics. So we'll start with the first one. So an important feature of a good antibiotic is selective toxicity to microbes, meaning that the drug will cause greater harm to the microbe than the human. Anyone can create a drug that will be excellent and kill the bacteria, but it might be so strong that it'll kill the human or be toxic to the human. So we wanna be careful with that. And we wanna make sure that the drug is interfering with important properties in the microbe, not human cells. Like we don't want it to interfere with how our cells make DNA or make protein. So we wanna be careful. And sometimes you create a really good drug, but it's too toxic to be systemic, so we use it topically. So these are a lot of our creams that we think of for like acne and um, different skin issues. All of these things are too toxic to be taken, so we have them in topical form. We also wanna consider the feature, how they're acting. So is your drug bactericidal, meaning that it kills the bacteria directly, or are you gonna create a drug that's bacteriostatic a drug which is a drug that inhibits bacterial growth. A big question that people have is, why not create drugs that are all bactericidal? What's the benefit of creating bacteriostatic? Well, bacteriostatic drugs or antibiotics are great because if bacteria grow so fast, they replicate so fast. So if you stop their replication and you limit them, are we have a really good immune system that can go and target that bacteria. So bacteriostatic drugs sometimes are less toxic than bacteriocidal drugs, but these are different antimicrobial actions. We want to consider the spectrum of activity of the antibiotic drug. So some antibiotics are broad spectrum, some antibiotics are narrow spectrum. Broad spectrum antibiotics are antibiotics that affect a broad range of bacteria. So we like to think of like gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Narrow spectrum antibiotics are the ones that affect a narrow range of bacteria. So maybe like uh, one specific type of bacteria, maybe just gram positive bacteria are infected, affected, not gram negative. So broad spectrum drugs are important for treating someone that has an acute life threatening disease. So if you have someone that comes to you, for example, in urgent care or in the ER and has an infection that's spreading rapidly and you don't know what it is, you're probably gonna prescribe them broad spectrum antibiotic because you know that it's gonna target a lot of things until the organism can be cultured until you discover what it is. Narrow spectrum antibiotics are usually less toxic and better in the sense that, remember antibiotics are, will 
kill everything they see, even the good bacteria. So it's best to always, if you can prescribe a narrow spectrum antibiotic because they're less disruptive to the microbiome, but you have to take time to culture the organism. So maybe if you have someone come to you with like a sore throat and they don't look like they're in a life threatening condition, you can take a sample from them, wait to get the results back from lab, then you discover that they have a gram positive infection such as strep throat, streptococcus infection, you can give them penicillin. So patients sometimes are started on a broad spectrum antibiotic and then later switch to a narrow spectrum antibiotic once we know what they have. A lot of times actually when people get surgery in general, they have catheters and catheters make you prone to infection. So just surgery in general because you're opening up someone's body. So a lot of times inherently after surgery, doctors have patients on antibiotics. Um, like when you, even when you get your wisdom teeth out, they'll have you on an antibiotic just to clear everything. And usually that's a broad spectrum antibiotic. So if we look at these classes of different antibiotics, we're going to talk about them. But if, for example, you look at tetracycline, it affects gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, chlamydia, other things. So this is considered a very broad range, broad spectrum antibiotic. Penicillin mostly affects gram-positive infection. So if you have someone with a gram-negative infection, it's not going to work. It's a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Another feature of antibiotics is we have to consider the tissue distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So different antibiotics behave differently. Some drugs, um, okay, so the best example I can give is like minocycline and doxycycline. They're used for a lot of things, but they're commonly prescribed for acne. Minocycline, I know this from taking it when I was young, it messes kind of with your head. So I remember calling the doctor and asking, well, I'm taking it for acne, but I'm having all these other symptoms. And the doctor told me that minocycline can cross the blood brain barrier. We have, I'm not going to get into anatomy, but your brain is protected very well because it's the most important organ of your body. Some drugs like, for example, antidepressants, different drugs that are meant to affect uh, different moods will cross this barrier, but most drugs cannot. So there are very few drugs, antibiotics, that can cross the blood-brain barrier, the CSF fluid that protects your brain. So you have to think about that when you create a drug or prescribe a drug. Some drugs can withstand stomach acid, very few. So if you have someone that has a stomach infection, you cannot give them an antibiotic that's going to be degraded in the stomach because of all the acid. You want to make sure the drug it's going to function where it's sent because the acid in the stomach is so strong. We also want to consider how long it takes for a body to metabolize or break down a drug, so the half-life of the medication. And if your, medi if your drug is broken down very frequently, you're going to prescribe it more often. So like penicillin generation five is taken multiple diet times a day because it's metabolized quickly. Whereas another antibiotic might only be taken once a day because it takes a longer time for your body to metabolize it. And then you also want to consider how it's leaving the body. Is it leaving it through urine? How is it leaving? So patients with different dysfunctions, we also have to take that into consideration. For example, patients with kidney and liver dysfunction excrete and metabolize medications a lot slower. So you don't want to give them a high dose and um, frequent medication. You want to adjust the dosage to avoid toxic levels. Another feature of antimicrobial drugs is how you administer it. So some drugs are only effective if they're given through IV, so intravenously. Intramuscular is in the muscle, uh, orally, topically, eye drops. So you, there's a, a lot of times when people get eye infections, if it's bacterial, not viral, you'll get the antibiotics as eye drops. And some of those, um, they only work in that route of administration. Effects of drug combinations. If you have someone who um, has cholesterol or heart problems or even like birth control, so many different things that they're taking, you want to make sure that you give them a drug that isn't going to affect other things that they're taking.
So synergism is when the effect of two drugs together is greater than the effect of one. Sometimes we prescribe someone two antibiotics because when you combine them, you see this big effect on the infection. Antagonism is when the effect of two drugs is less than the effect of either alone. So um, you want to be be careful with antagonistic drugs. And um, the example I was mentioning it was antagonism. So if you have someone who, birth control is very common. So people who take birth control, sometimes the antibiotics will affect the birth control. So that's an antagonistic relationship. They're causing one drug to not be as effective. So you wanna take that into consideration. And then also we want to think about adverse effects of our antibiotic drugs. Allergies, so sulfa drugs and penicillin antibiotics can cause life-threatening allergies. We talked about that in the immune disorders. A lot of times people with antibiotic allergies will wear bracelets in case something happens to them. The doctors know not to, to not just give them penicillin, but not give them anything in that family of drugs. They can have toxic side effects. So I wanted to save this example for now. So when I was talking about how some antibiotics, if they're given through eye drops, um, a lot of times those antibiotics, the eye drop ones, there's a specific type, I forgot what it is, an antibiotic that cannot be given to a woman that's pregnant because it's toxic to pregnant women, but can be given to someone who's not pregnant. So we wanna consider those things. And with antibiotics, a lot of times they do affect our normal flora. So broad spectrum antibiotics kill the infection, but also kill all the good bacteria in you. So then you'll get overgrowth of bacteria that we really want under control, such as C. diff or Clostridium difficile. And resistance to antimicrobial drugs. So a lot of bacteria are innately resistant to antibiotics or have acquired resistance to antibiotics. So we want to think about this. Innate resistance is when like you you as a bacteria haven't really done anything. You're just resistant to a bacteria because it doesn't work for you. So for example, the bacteria mycoplasma, they don't have cell walls. So you can't, if someone has a mycoplasma infection, you can't give them an antibiotic that targets cell wall because they're resistant to it. Some bacteria have acquired resistance. This is the concern we have in our world right now because through mutations and through getting resistance plasmids, and we'll learn about that later in this lecture. So that is a concern. And we have last resort drugs, which are like vancomycin, carpapenem, because we do not want to always prescribe these. We don't want bacteria to become resistant to these because we do not have newer drugs. So these were features of antibiotics that I want everyone to keep in mind. And you will learn more about these if any of you guys go to any healthcare profession school, you'll take pharmacology and learn about production of medicine. So now we're going to focus on how, how antibiotics work. Antibiotics have five different mechanisms of action depending on the antibiotic. Remember, the goal of the antibiotic is one of two things. Either kill the bacteria, meaning it's bactericidal, or stop the bacteria from further growing, meaning bacteria static, so inhibiting growth. So some antibiotics will inhibit the cell wall synthesis of bacteria. Bacteria have a cell wall. If you you interfere as a drug with the bacteria cell wall, you interfere with the bacteria being able to grow. So this is a good antibiotic. Some antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis in bacteria. Protein synthesis is very important. So will you harm the bacteria if you stop protein synthesis? Some bacteria inhibit nucleic acid replication and transcription, so you're affecting uh, DNA, RNA. Some injure the plasma membrane of bacteria. So all of these things are important for bacteria. And some interfere or inhibit certain metabolic pathways in bacteria that are essential. So different antibiotics target different things and we're gonna go through different classes of antibiotics. So targets of antimicrobial drugs, again, some antibiotics inhibit cell wall synthesis, some inhibit protein synthesis, some inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, DNA and RNA, some interfere with plasma membrane, 
some inhibit metabolic pathways. Um, if anyone is taking an antibiotic right now, any antibiotic, whether it's like oral, topical, whatever, even if you're using Neosporin, I suggest you guys look at the name of the antibiotic and in Google, like for example, if you're taking amoxicillin, just put amoxicillin mechanism of action. I always do it when I'm taking an antibiotic. It's like really nerdy, but it's cool to know how they are affecting the bacteria in your body. Okay, we're going to start, we're going to talk about each one of the things I talked about. We're going to focus now on the, on the antibiotics that inhibit cell wall synthesis. So bacterial cells have peptidoglycan. You guys all know this. We learned this early on in the semester. That's what the cell wall is made up of. So antibiotics that inhibit peptidoglycan or cell wall synthesis are create antibiotics because they affect the bacteria. They cause the bacteria to lyse. So if you look at, here's a picture of bacteria and here is a picture of a bacteria plus an antibiotic added that inhibits its cell wall. It causes the bacteria to burst, which is good if you have an infection. Do human cells have a cell wall? If we were face-to-face -face in class, I would ask you this, and I would hope that most of you would say, no, we don't. So these antibiotics do not target, do not harm our cells, which is a good thing. And the spectrum of drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis varies. There's some narrow spectrum drugs, some broad spectrum drugs. A lot of them are narrow range. They're bactericidal because they cause the cell to lyse, so they kill bacteria. And drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis include beta-lactam antibiotics. Beta-lactam antibiotics are drugs that have a beta-lactam ring in them. I'll show a picture in a second. Glycopeptide antibiotics and bastracin, if anyone has heard of this drug. So remember, in bacteria, you have the cell membrane. And then outside the cell membrane, you have the cell wall made up of pepto peptidoglycan. So the three classes of drugs that fall into inhibit cell wall synthesis, again, are beta-lactam antibiotics, glycopeptide antibiotics, and bastricin. Okay, so beta-lactam drugs are any drugs that have a beta-lactam ring. So if you, if you are a chemist, a beta-lactam ring looks like this. It's this ring of CH, CH, and C double bonded to oxygen. That's a beta-lactam ring. So if we look at penicillin, like if you were to take the structure of the drug penicillin or the antibiotic of penicillin, penicillin has beta-lactam drug. Um, so does cephalosporin. So these are any drugs that have a beta-lactam ring. And then it's penicillin and any derivative. So amoxicillin, um, I can't think of anything else. Anything that ends in psyllin is in this family of drugs. Glycopeptide antibiotics such as vancomycin, which is an antibiotic that we save for very severe infections, is also inhibits cell wall. And then bastricin, which is found in topical antibiotic ointments. Topical antibiotic ointments, topical means you put it on the surface, it's not inside you. An example of that is neosporin. It's, they usually have multiple drugs in them. One of the drugs in this triple antibiotic ointment, it's triple, so it has three antibiotics, is bastricin, which targets the cell wall of bacteria. So now that we learn that these drugs, some of them have beta-lactam rings, some bacteria have developed or have enzymes that target this beta-lactam ring in the drug. So remember, the beta-lactam ring is in the drug. If the bacteria can break the beta-lactam ring in the drug, the drug is not effective anymore. The antibiotic isn't. So some bacteria make an enzyme called beta-lactamase. It's an, an enzyme that breaks beta-lactam ring. And this is bad because the drugs are not effective. So an example of a beta-lactamase is penicillinase. It's an enzyme that breaks down penicillin. And so this enzyme, we see it in staphylococcus bacteria. So this is why with staphylococcus bacteria, they're, they're resistant 
to a lot of the antibiotics in this group. And then extended spectrum beta lactamases inactivate a lot of drugs that have beta lactam rings. We see it in different E. coli and Klebsiella species. Klebsiella causes different infections, but it causes a lot of urinary tract infections. And carpenamases are enzymes that break the carpenaeum drug that we see in these antibiotics. So, and, and bacteria that you may have heard of are Klebsiella pneumoniae that have these enzymes. These are why these bacteria are very hard to treat. And then the NDMI1, the, this enzyme does really make these drugs very hard to use. So the drugs are not effective on the organisms anymore. And this is a very bad thing for us. This is one example of how bacteria have overcome a very great drug that has been created over time. Topicals, we see less resistance development with topicals because usually they have different antibiotics, different mechanisms of action, and usually you're putting it on a limited area. It's not all over the body and you're using it less frequently. You're not doing like 10 days or two weeks of it. You're doing less use, less use on a limited area. The next mechanism of action that we see with antibiotics are some antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis. So pr remember, proteins are made on ribosomes and bacteria have 70S ribosomes. So these drugs inhibit protein synthesis by attaching maybe to the 50S subunit of the 70S ribosome or the 30S subunit. The whole 70S ribosome, remember, is made up of a 50S large subunit and a 30S small subunit. Examples of drugs that inhibit protein synthesis are chloramphenicol, aminoglycosides, and tetracycline. So tetracycline is a very broad spectrum antibiotic. Macrolids such as erythromycin. So all of these drugs stop protein synthesis in one way or the other. And these drugs can be narrow spectrum or broad spectrum. They're bacteriostatic, meaning they stop, they halt the growth of further bacterial infection so that your immune system can fight them. But aminoglycosides, such as streptomycin, neomycin, are bactericidal, so they actually kill the bacteria. We are concerned with toxicity with these drugs. So remember these drugs affect various components of the 70S ribosome. Well, when you look at the mitochondria in humans, if you guys remember, our mitochondria also have a 70S ribosome. So there is some fear of the dosage and the length that you're giving a drug affecting the mitochondria in humans. This is why sometimes these drugs can cause fatigue. Direct effects, some drugs such as chloramphenicol can suppress bone marrow and affect blood cell formation. They can cause auditory to damage, so you have to be careful with what you prescribe. They can be toxic. And a lot of these drugs, such as tetracycline, tetracycline is broad spectrum, so it affects gram-positive and gram-negative infections. It can also affect our good normal flora, normal, uh, normal bacteria. The next mechanism of action for drugs are those that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. So here we're affecting DNA or mRNA. So inhibit DNA replication or RNA synthesis. This is like DNA getting converted to mRNA in transcription. If you affect DNA replication or transcription or any of these processes, you are harming the bacteria, which is a good thing. So examples of these drugs are fluoroquinolones. These inhibit DNA gyrase. If you guys remember, DNA gyrase causes the DNA to supercoil. So if they stop that, then you're affecting the bacteria, you're harming them. So ciprofloxacin is an example. Rifamycin stops mRNA synthesis. If you stop mRNA synthesis in bacteria, the bacteria can no longer grow because you need mRNA. Metronidazole binds DNA in anaerobic organisms. So if someone has an infection with an anaerobic bacteria, this is a good drug to prescribe. And these drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis you guys can think about it. Nucleic acids are in both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, so they're broad spectrum. Whereas with the drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis, well, gram-positive bacteria have a big cell wall. Gram-negative bacteria have an additional outer membrane. So that's why those that inhibit cell wall synthesis are more narrow spectrum. They're more effective against 
gram positive bacteria. So I want you guys to think about these things rather than just memorize a lot of these points. If a drug is inhibiting DNA and RNA, it's going to affect many different types of organisms. So it's broad spectrum. And these are bactericidal. You kill the bacteria with these drugs. Finally, there's antibiotics that interfere with the plasma membrane or cell membrane. It's the same thing. So they affect the cell membrane of bacteria. They make it more permeable or they affect synthesis of the cell membrane, causing the cell to leak. And this is a bad thing because it can lead to cell death. Examples of these drugs are daptomycin, which is a drug, if you look on this image here, here's a cell membrane. It inserts itself into the cell membrane of bacteria. So we see that we use this drug with skin infections. It's not very effective with gram-negative bacteria. If any of you guys remember, so gram-negative bacteria have a cell membrane, a thin layer of cell wall, and then an outer membrane. This drug cannot get in because of the outer membrane. Polymyxin B, though, is good for gram-negative membranes because it can bind to the outer membrane. And these are narrow-spectrum drugs. So you usually see them like um, they affect either gram-positive bacteria, such as daptomycin, or gram-negative bacteria, such as polymyxin B. They're bactericidal. If you affect the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, and you make it permeable, you're going to kill the bacteria. Then this is the final one, um, a mechanism of action of antibiotics. Some inhibit metabolic pathways. So bacteria have so many different metabolisms that they do. The goal of making a drug that affects the metabolism is you want to make sure that the metabolism is found in bacteria and not in humans because you don't want to affect the metabolism in us. So there are drugs that inhibit various metabolic pathways in bacteria. This is why it's good to research metabolism in bacteria. One important metabolic pathway we see in bacteria is the folate pathway. So bacteria make folate. Folate is one type of vitamin B. This is very essential because folate, both in humans and in bacteria, vitamin B is important because it produces nucleotides. So nucleotides like thymine that's seen in DNA. If you interfere with this pathway, the bacteria cannot grow anymore. So bacteria have these folate pathway, uh, um, pathways and different drugs have been created that stop this folate pathway. If you stop it, you will not get important nucleotides. Therefore, the bacteria will be harmed by the drug. So sulfa drugs and trimethoprim are examples of antibiotics that inhibit the folate pathway or the folate metabolic pathway. They're broad spectrum because we see this pathway in gram positive and gram negative bacteria. They target both groups. And they're bacteria static. The reason they're bacteria static is if you think about it, the bacteria have already grown. So when you're giving this, you're kind of just halting the growth until the immune system can come and target them. And these, they're, um, with these drugs, they're often combined because when you combine these drugs, you see a much bigger effect. So if you combine a sulfa drug with trimethoprim, they'll affect different um, areas of the folate pathway, like making folate. So therefore the bacteria will be halted. And then I just put a graph here of different antibiotics and their names. So the brand names that maybe some of you guys have heard of and the component that's in them. So this is just for your own good if, you, if anyone wants to look up an antibiotic that they're taking. And then I just put also antibiotics here that inhibit cell wall synthesis antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis, those that affect the plasma membrane, those that affect DNA or RNA, which are nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, those that affect essential metabolites in metabolic pathways. Okay, so now we learned about antibiotics and their different mechanisms of action. So the different things that they can target, whether it's a cell wall, cell membrane, metabolic pathways, protein synthesis, or um, nucleic acid inhibitors. Well, if you, if someone has an infection, you wanna give them the proper antibiotic. And the way to do this is to determine 
is the bacteria that they're infected with susceptible or sensitive to that antibiotic? So different tests are done in lab to determine susceptibility of infections to antibiotics. And the goal is to give the patient a drug that's targeted for in the, their infection and to give them the drug that's the lowest dose that will not be very toxic. So if someone has um, like a lung infection or a throat infection, their bacterial infections, maybe you can give them five different antibiotics and they'll all work. You want to give them an antibiotic that's the least toxic for whatever infection they have and that will harm them the least weight. That's why you do these tests. So the tests that we're going to talk about are the Kirby Bauer disc diffusion test, which you were supposed to do in lab, but I did a lab uh, video for you guys, the broth dilution tests and the E-test, and there's newer genetic testing. So is this strategy used with every infection? So if someone, if you are a doctor or a PA or a nurse and someone comes to you with an infection, are you going to send their culture, the bacterial culture to lab with every infection? No, not necessarily, but it is done with most infections. This is why we send samples to lab. So the lab can tell us what bacteria they have. And for those that we haven't already established, which antibiotics work, you would do these tests. The traditional method of testing if antibiotics are effective is the Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion test. So in this test, you take an agar plate and you grow bacteria all over. So maybe someone has a bacterial throat infection or a lung infection. You take a sample and you grow it all over the agar plate. So you streak it, you spread it, the bacteria everywhere. Then you take these discs, again, which are little pieces of paper here that are dipped in high concentrations of different antibiotics, and you spread Spread them all around your plate that has bacteria on it. So maybe this is amoxicillin, this is tetracycline, this is penicillin, this is some sort of sulfa drug. So you test different antibiotics and then you incubate the, the plate. Then you come back later and you see where are zones of inhibition. Zones of inhibition are where bacteria did not grow, they were inhibited. So you, like if this is amoxicillin, this here is a zone of inhibition where the bacteria was inhibited. So you figure out, so the Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion test lets you see which, if bacteria are sensitive or resistant to an antibiotic. You have to compare them with a known chart, but like just taking a look at this plate, this, this antibiotic looks effective. This one potentially looks effective. This one does not. There's bacteria growing all around it. So if I gave the patient this antibiotic, it would do nothing for their infection. Bacteria would still grow in their throat. So after you do the Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion test, you're probably gonna do another test to determine, okay, what concentration is the most effective? May it, maybe with tetracycline, um, 10 milligrams is, is effective, but so is 500 milligrams. You want to give them the least amount of the drug dosage that's effective. So one test that we do is um, the broth dilution test. And with this test, this is a test that lets you determine something called the MIC, which stands for minimum inhibitory concentration, which is the smallest dose of the drug needed to prevent growth of the microbe. So if we look at, these are different organisms. You put the bacteria in tubes and you add different amounts of the drug. So you, you add no drug, um, all the way to a lot of the drug and you see what happens to the bacteria. So when we look here, so here's no bacteria, here's bacteria growing. So here we see bacteria growing, here we see bacteria growing, here we see bacteria growing, here we see no bacteria growing. So at 0.12 micrograms per milliliter of this drug, bacteria is inhibited, but it's also inhibited at eight micrograms per milliliter. The minimum inhibitory concentration of this drug is 0 0.12. This is the least I need of the drug that will give me the, the basically the effect I need to kill the bacteria. So with the broth dilution tests, you're determining the minimum dose that you need. So the minimum inhibitory concentration of the drug. And again, with the broth dilution test, 
Another way to do it is you have these swells, like in this image, these little openings. And actually, this is a better image than the one before for you guys to see it. So here we have different antibiotics, doxycycline, a sulfa drug, streptomycin, and here are other different antibiotics. You take the antibiotics and you put them from low concentration to high concentration, and then you put bacteria in all the wells. Here, White spots means that bacteria grew. With doxycycline, at the lowest and at the highest concentration, bacteria grew in all the wells. So this is a very bad antibiotic to prescribe for whatever infection this is. With this sulfa drug, I see a lot of bacteria growing at low drug dosage, then a little bit less bacteria, then less. Then at high drug dosage, I see very little. And at the highest drug dosage, I see no bacteria. Streptomycin, I see no growth in any of the dosages. And um, here are the other two antibiotics. So I always ask this to my students when we're in class and I tell them, if you had a patient, let's just focus on these three drugs, and they came to you with a very bad bacterial lung infection, and you wanted to see what to give them, would you give them doxycycline, this sulfa drug, or streptomycin? And we go through each one. Would you give them doxycycline? No, because we see bacteria growing in all the dosages. Okay, what about sulfa? It works at a high dosage. What about streptomycin? Well, even at the lowest dosage, the bacteria don't grow. So students' first response is give the patient streptomycin. And I always say, no, you cannot just answer it based on this because if you're a good researcher and a clinical microbiologist, now that I know that both the sulfa drug at high concentration and streptomycin at all concentrations are effective for this patient, I wouldn't just necessarily say, okay, give them streptomycin at the lowest concentration. I would go and learn more about the drugs. What's the toxic effect? Is my patient pregnant? Is one of these drugs, what if streptomycin is not good for pregnant women? So you wanna consider a lot of things once you do this and know the minimum inhibitory concentration. And then finally, another really good test to determine susceptibility of infections to antibiotics is the E-test. E stands for epsilometer, so this is a measuring system. So these are paper strips that are similar to the discs with a Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion but they have different concentrations of the antibiotic. So they have the lowest concentration of an antibiotic all the way to the highest concentration that they do on these strips. It's pretty impressive actually. And you put the strips on a plate with bacteria and you see where the, what's the lowest amount of the antibiotic that can be given. So here, this usually at the bottom of the teardrop, if you think of this as a teardrop, this concentration is the lowest concentration, this is the highest. So I can give this patient this concentration, which is 1.25, whatever the units are, maybe micrograms per milliliter of that drug. So here with the tests we talked about, only the E-test and the broth dilution test can help you determine the minimum inhibitory concentration. Kirby Bauer does not. There's also newer genetic testing. So newer genetic testing takes the organism that's causing the infection, the bacteria, and you could sequence it or do PCR and look for different genes it has that make it um, resistant to different antibiotics. Now we're gonna talk about drug resistance. So we learned about how bacteria are affected by antibiotics. So they, their cell wall can be affected, their proteins can be affected, they're affected, their nucleic acids can be affected. Now we wanna learn, well, if they know how they're harmed, how are they resisting the drugs? So bacterial resistance develops it a lot and it's not a good thing for us because then drugs are no longer effective and drug resistance favor the growth of bacteria. So resistance genes are acquired in two ways. This is how bacteria become resistant to drugs, either through mutation over time, random mutation that happens in the bacteria's lifetime. Maybe a mistake gets made during replication or transcription translation, or they acquire R plasmids, which is resistance plasmids. Remember in horizontal gene transfer, bacteria can get different plasmids like through conjugation, through different ways. So the two ways that bacteria can get resistance genes are through mutation or plasmids. So this is very important for you to know. If ever asked, 
How can they develop resistance genes? It's either mutation or positives. And the mechanism of drug resistance, once they've either gained a mutation or a resistance plasmid, the way that that's effective is it can, there's four different mechanisms of action that bacteria can take to be resistant to a drug. So they can block the entry of the drug. So if you have a bacteria, let's say this bacteria here is causing an infection and this is a drug, some bacteria have gained a mutation or a plasmid that makes them stop the drug from entering at all. So they completely block it from entering. Some bacteria can inactivate or destroy the drug by certain enzymes that they produce. So if you think of beta-lactamases, those are enzymes that basically break the penicillin drug by harming the beta-lactam ring. Some bacteria can alter the drug's target molecule. So if you have a drug that's targeting protein or something else, maybe the bacteria can alter that molecule so that drug no longer works. Some bacteria, I think this is the coolest one that bacteria do, they can pump out the antibiotic very quickly. So as soon as the antibiotic goes in, it's ejected or effluxed out. So they have these pumps that remove the compound from the cell, the antibiotic. So these are very important things. The four mechanisms of drug resistance. Bacteria can block entry of the drug. They can inactivate the drug by enzymes that the bacteria have. They can alter the drug's target molecule or they can quickly pump out or efflux of the antibiotic. We're, we've been very concerned with drug resistant organisms. So now that you guys know different ways that they do that, this is very bad for us because that means that if you have, like let's say you have a bacteria, if I go back, and it can do all of these things. How do you treat that infection? Someone has, let's say a kidney infection, a bad kidney infection, and you want to treat it and the bacteria that they have stops the drug from entering inactivates the enzymes of the drug, alters the drug's target molecule, and pumps out the drug. You cannot treat this infection anymore. So this is a big concern we have with drug-resistant organisms. Superbugs are basically drug-resistant organisms. Organisms, that bacteria that are resistant to many different antibiotics, we call superbugs. They're very bad bugs. And there are many examples of superbugs that are becoming very hard to treat. So every year, the CDC publishes this journal called Antibiotic Resistance Threats in the United States. And they list urgent threats, serious threats, and concerning threats. So if you look at 2019, one of the urgent threats they have on there is carpineum resistant bacteria. And you can see drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea is a bacteria that causes the disease gonorrhea. It's becoming resistant to so many different drugs. So for this year, they have it on the list. Then we have serious threats like vancomycin resistant enterococci. So these are things that the CDC says we need to be very wary of that. If people get these infections, they're very hard to treat because these bacteria have become resistant to so many different drugs that we have. And annually in the US, the CDC estimates that we have about 2 million illnesses from superbugs and about 20,000 deaths from these antibiotic resistant organisms or superbugs. So I'm gonna talk about three or four of them that are very important and unfortunately common. So one superbug we're gonna talk about is vancomycin resistant enterococci. So enterococci are part of the normal intestinal microbiota. So if you look at someone's large intestines, we see a lot of these bacteria. The problem is when these bacteria move to areas where they shouldn't be or over dominate. And we're gonna learn about that with healthcare associated infections later. These bacteria the, are becoming less susceptible to antimicrobials when they do cause infection because they've gained many resistance plasmids. One of the resistance plasmids that these species gained is a resistance plasmid against the drug vancomycin. So vancomycin resistant enterococci are not you cannot treat them with vancomycin anymore. And vancomycin is a very strong, effective antibiotic. So if these bacteria are no longer responding to it, this is a big area of concern. What do you do when 
someone's in a hospital and they get an infection with this organism how do you treat them so this is a very important superbug that is a threat right now that researchers are studying further to see what can we do about these infections Another very common superbug or two superbugs are MRSA and MRSA. MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA is vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So Staph aureus is bacteria that you naturally see in the human microbiota. Again, it can cause disease when it either overgrows or goes to an area that it shouldn't be. Like for example, if it enters your bloodstream, it's very can cause a very bad infection. So a lot of these bacteria are resistant to penicillin because they have the enzyme that breaks penicillin. They have penicillinases and they have low affinity for beta-lactam antibiotics. So we're seeing a lot of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These are usually um, resistant to all the mesicillin family of drugs and they're usually treated with vancomycin so if you have someone that comes to you with a MRSA infection you which is can look like a very bad skin infection like a really bad spider bite and you usually give them vancomycin well now from prescribing so much vancomycin for MRSA we're seeing that MRSA has changed into versa which is now resistant to vancomycin. So MRSA and VRSA are very resistant superbugs that we have. So we have treatment for MRSA, but we wanna be careful because prescribing so much vancomycin is leading to a lot of strains of vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And then one important superbug is MDRTB, which is multiple drug resistant tuberculosis and extensive drug resistant tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, which is a very bad lung infection, is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This infection is very hard to treat. The bacteria grow so slow. So you give a person a very, they take a long treatment. Usually it's six months of taking antibiotics. And these bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotics we're prescribing because patients are not complying with the treatment. They think they feel fine, so they stop taking the antibiotic, and then you have a superbug grow. So multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is resistant to two favored first-line antibiotics. Extensive drug resistant tuberculosis is a very big risk because it's resistant to a lot of the antibiotic medications we give to TB patients. So tuberculosis is a problem that we have in the world and in many different parts of the world actually because of the therapy that's required and because of the resistance that's developing to this six month long therapy. And then finally, the last superbug I'm going to talk about is Carpineum resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So these bacteria, um, not the Carpineum resistant ones, Enterobacteriaceae are a common cause of healthcare associated infections. But these bacteria are innately resistant to many antibiotics. So they have an outer membrane because they're gram-negative bacteria. And this uh, gram-negative bacteria generally are hard to treat because this outer membrane really protects the bacteria from drugs getting in. They also, some of them produce beta-lactamases. So recently, there's been development of Carpineum resistant enterobacteriaceae infections. And these bugs are, these superbugs are resistant to nearly all antibiotics. We were using a very toxic antibiotic to treat them with, which is already bad to begin with, but it was what was working. And now even that toxic antibiotic is not working. So Carpineum resistant enterobacteriaceae infections are a serious risk that we have in the world right now. So why do we have the spread of antibiotic resistance? Why are bacteria gaining mutations and plasmids and being able to block entry of drugs and break the drug's target molecule and do all these things? Why do we have these superbugs? And it's because of two reasons. It's overuse of drugs and misuse of antibiotics. People are misusing and overusing antibiotics.
So misuse includes using outdated or weakened antibiotics. A lot of times people will find an old box of antibiotics or old container of antibiotics at home that's been expired. And this can be due to many reasons with the cost of antibiotics, all this stuff. So they'll think that it's still effective and this causes a lot more harm than good. This B is a very big problem we have. We have a lot of people that think that when they have a viral infection, such as the common cold, you can use antibiotics. Antibiotics do nothing for viral infection, zero, but we still have this big myth in the world that when people have viral infections, we, they should take antibiotics. There are so many parents that come into doctor's offices with their kids having a common cold or something that's very, that doesn't need antibiotics and they're asking for antibiotics. We use a lot of antibiotics in animal feed, so agriculture, and this is leading to a lot of antibiotic resistance on bacteria's part. Failing to complete the prescribed regimen, so people maybe are prescribed to take antibiotics for six months with TB or two weeks with some infection, and people will feel better in two, three days or however long, and they'll think that they can stop the antibiotics. This is very bad. You have to complete the antibiotics to stop the resistant bugs from growing and using someone else's leftover prescription is obviously also very bad. So all of these things, which as you guys can imagine happen in the world every single day are leading to more super bugs, more carpineum resistant organisms, more MRSA and VRSA and extensive resistant tuberculosis organisms, which is very serious if for our healthcare system and for us in general. We can see the spread of antibiotic resistance in this image. So we see a lot of antibiotics given to animals and given to humans. When given to animals, and this applies, I use, sometimes I have students ask me, are vegetarians affected? Yes, vegetarians are also affected by antibiotics used in animal feed because a lot of animal feces are used as fertilizer or runoff from, maybe you have cows and you have the runoff from them going into like a lettuce farm. So it does affect everyone. So fertilizer containing the animal feces that has drug resistant bacteria because these animals were given antibiotics is used on food crops. People eat these food crops and now you have these antibiotic resistant bacteria in the human gut. Or maybe you, ha and you have humans taking antibiotics and they are not taking it properly for whatever reason they can or patients in healthcare settings it can spread to them so we see a lot of spread of antibiotic resistance in different ways and i think one of the main things we really need to limit antibiotics and animal use someone once asked me why do we give antibiotics to animals well if you give antibiotics to animals you limit infection and therefore you can put 500 chickens in a small room and it's more cost effective on the farmer's part. So it's not a good thing, but that's one reason. And sometimes also antibiotics make animals bigger and fatter so you get more meat from them to sell. Slowing the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance, this is something that we all play a part in. So we do not want to overuse and misuse antibiotics. The CDC and the FDA track and regulate how many antibiotics are used in farm and in food. And I think that they could be doing a stronger job of limiting, especially in the US. Like if you look at US regulations compared to regulations in different countries in Europe, You'll see that in Europe, they have stricter, in different countries, they have stricter regulations for how much antibiotics you can put in animal feed. And then physicians, healthcare workers, and patients have to be careful in working in healthcare settings because there is, it's kind of like an incubator of all these super bugs. Globally, we need to limit the antibiotics in food. Over-the-counter antibiotics, we don't think about it, but there are many different over-the-counter antibiotics you can get. Neosporin, antibiotic soap, just different things that you can get that are antibiotic. You don't, no one needs this unless you, okay, unless you actually need it, you work in healthcare, or for some reason only need to use antibiotic soap. We really need to limit the use of these things. Daily products, acne medications, different things that are in a way, le letting 
bacteria that are not antibiotic resistant die and those that are antibiotic resistant spread. And this is what we need to limit here. With antibiotic development, so just to recap from the beginning of the lecture, when antibiotics were developed, they were thought of as the magic bullet that was going to kill all bacterial infections. And antibiotics are amazing. They're great. They limited a lot of our bacterial infections. So if we think of the world without antibiotics, it would be very different than it is today. But today, there is a huge lack of incentive for drug companies to develop antibiotics because in a pharmaceutical company's mind, they think that, why should I spend so much time, energy, and money? Money is very important. Trying to come up with a new antibiotic that I think probably will be useless in a few years. So penicillin is not very effective right now. Amoxicillin ampicillin, a lot of these drugs that companies took years to develop are not effective. So to them, they're not very profitable. And this is a big problem for the general public, for all of us, that companies are not working to develop new antibiotics. If you look at this graph that shows you from 20 years ago compared to today, look, look at the graph. So this is showing you 20 years ago compared to today, but I could put a more updated graph. You can see that years ago, we were developing more antibiotics. It still wasn't a lot, but it was like in the 15 to 20 drug range. And now they're getting less and less and less because pharmaceutical companies would rather work on like a cholesterol drug or a drug they, they know will be effective. So the strategies are scientists try to modify old drugs, come up with new generations of drugs and develop out of the box alternatives. Out of the box alternatives to antibiotics are vaccines. So if we can develop vaccines so we don't have this huge spread of antibiotic resistance, phage therapy, remember phage are viruses that infect bacteria. So if you can create viruses that will target specific bacterial infections, you will limit antibiotic resistance. Exploring new sources for new antibiotics, so soil, oceans, extreme honey, extreme environments, honey. Honey is, um, honey is a compound that can be antibiotic. Hunting for genes, so looking at bacteria and coming up with new targets that your drug could target. So maybe if your bacteria has flagella that help it move really well in the stomach or in the intestine, you can create a drug that targets that that won't harm the humans. Gene regulations, we learned about RNA interference, antimicrobial peptides with the immune system, so coming up with immune therapy. Quorum sensing interference, remember quorum sensing is when bacteria communicate with each other. So if you can stop them from communicating with each other and forming biofilms, you can hopefully limit infection. Probiotics, giving patients good bacteria that will target the bad bacteria. Predatory bacteria are, this is an idea of bacteria that will go and target the bad bacteria, kill it. And immune stimulation, can we do different immune therapy so that a person's B cells and T cells and different leukocytes can be more effective in targeting an infection. Then the next two slides I'm gonna focus on are not on antibiotics. So now we're gonna just briefly talk about antiviral drugs. So we talked about antibiotics and the different compounds that they can affect. Now we're gonna talk about antiviral drugs. Viruses have a very different mechanism of action in infection compared to bacteria. Viruses, as you guys I'm hoping remember from the virus lecture, to infect a cell, they have to fuse to your cell, they have to enter your cell, they have to uncoat, remove their capsid, they have to replicate their genetic material, whether it's RNA or DNA, they have to assemble and then they have to exit and infect more cells to cause an infection. So antiviral drugs work on inhibiting any one of these processes. So there are drugs that inhibit the entry of the virus or the fusion of the virus to your cells. So these are all things that people think about when they're creating a drug for coronavirus. Can we inhibit coronavirus from entering and fusing to your cells? Because this would be a great thing to stop viral replication. Can you create a drug that inhibits uncoating of the virus? Because if you don't have the genetic material in, the virus cannot replicate itself. Can you stop genome integration? Can you inhibit nucleic acid synthesis? 
There's reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We talked about that with HIV. Protease inhibitors, can you stop making important, can you inhibit important enzymes that the virus needs to replicate? Exit inhibitors, can you create an antiviral drug that stops the virus from exiting our cells? Therefore, the virus will not go on and infect 500 more cells. So the, there is a problem with the antiviral drugs. So we, if I ask any of you guys, can you name me a few antibiotics? Everyone can name me probably one or two antibiotics, if not more, like five different antibiotics. The reason why antiviral drugs are not that common and we don't hear about them that much is one, usually your immune system targets the virus, but two reasons is that one, with a lot of these things, if you think about it, you could potentially harm the human host. So if you're inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis in the virus, can't you potentially also harm nucleic acid synthesis in the human? So you wanna be careful. There's not a lot of creativity with viruses. So with bacteria, for example, they have a cell wall, they have a 70S ribosome. We don't have a cell wall. Besides the mitochondria, we don't have a 70S ribosome. So the drugs are not that toxic to us. Whereas with antiviral drugs, you have to be careful to not make drugs that are toxic to the human. Another possible problem is a lot of times viruses mutate a lot. So you create a drug that stops coding, uncoding, and then all of a sudden the virus comes up with a new way to do this, it mutates. So that's another problem. Finally, we're gonna end with antifungal drugs in our antimicrobial lecture. So fungus are, can cause a lot, fungi, fungi can also cause a lot of infections. And we're gonna focus on drugs that injure the plasma membrane of fungus. I wanna remind everyone that fungus is a eukaryote and we're eukaryotes. So sometimes it's hard to treat drugs. It's hard to create drugs for organisms that are like us. So they're eukaryotes, we're eukaryotes. We have to figure out what do they have that we don't have so that when you create a drug, it's not harming the human host. And one thing we do see is that in the plasma membrane of fungi, there are sterols. There are certain sterols that we don't have. We have cholesterol. They have sterols called ergosterol or ergosterols that we don't have. So the drug such as clotrimazole targets these sterols and it doesn't hurt our cells. So this is an important thing in treating fungus infections such as those caused by yeast. So keep that in mind. And then finally, that's the end of the lecture. So just keep in mind bacteria, how, what they look like drugs and what we think of when we're targeting bacteria. So are you targeting the cell wall? Are you talking or targeting protein synthesis? All these things. How do bacteria develop resistance to drugs? And that was through resistance plasmids and mutations. They can lock entry of the drug. They can change the target enzyme. They can pump out the drug. So different ways. And how do we try to stop antibiotic resistance from spreading, and that's in stopping misuse and overuse of antibiotics. So I hope this whole lecture made sense to you guys and that you guys learned something about antibiotics.